at Acts chapter 16. And the title of our Bible study tonight is Looking for Divine Appointments. Looking for Divine Appointments. A few weeks ago, my wife and I were headed up to a meeting at Lake Arrowhead, and we got off the freeway, we started winding up the hill, and when we got past the Lake Gregory turnoff, we're on that rim of the world drive so many of you have been on, and the road got to a narrow place, and off to our right, of course, was the guardrail and the cliff that goes way, way down, and on the left, the mountains that go up. And as we rounded a bend, um, there was a silver SUV that was in the other lane that had stopped. And I wonder what in the world's going on. Maybe they were having car problems or something. And so we slowed down and I rolled down my window. And uh, when I got near the SUV, I could see why they had stopped because just behind them, uh, there was a car that had uh, flipped over uh, and was in the ditch. And I rolled my window down, this lady, she's uh, in the SUV, and I said, what happened? She said, this car was right in front of me, and uh, it just flipped, and it's upside down. There's a man inside. And so uh, the road's so narrow, you can't park anywhere, and I'm thinking people are going to come up and plow me from behind or come down the other way and plow her from behind. So we went up the road just a little bit where there was a turnout, and I pulled over, and I said, wait here, Colleen, and... I jumped out of the car and I ran down to where the overturned car was. And by the time I got there, some other cars had stopped. And uh, there were two men that were trying to pull open what um, was the passenger side door. It was upside down. And they couldn't do it because it was wedged down in on the asphalt of the road. And they were working hard at it. And I thought, you know, I, I could probably get around the other side and get in there. I'm a skinny guy. And so I went around the back of the car and crawled through the bushes, opened the back door and uh, crawled in the compartment. There was still the dust of uh, the airbags that had gone off. And, and in that upside down car, I stuck my head in between the two front seats. And uh, here's this man hanging uh, uh, on his seat with his seatbelt on. And I got right up in his face and I said, uh, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm okay. Um, he said, but I can't get out. And I said, we'll help you. I said, we'll help you. You're going to be okay. And I got out the car, went around the other side. I told the guys, I said, you know what? We can get in on the other side and we can help this guy. And so we ran around the other side. We opened the driver's side door. We got up underneath him, unhooked the seatbelt pulled him out and took him away from where the car was. And we sat him down on the rock. By then, there were a lot of cars that were stopped. And and I just began to talk to him. I said, what's your name? And he said, my name is Jim. And I said, the, the police, the paramedics, they're on their way. You're going to be OK. I said, is there anyone that I can call for you? Can I call your wife? Or do you have any kids? And he said, well, nah. He said, my wife is down in Bellflower. He said, we actually are from Texas. He said, my son committed suicide two days ago, and that's why we're here in California. And I said to him, Jim, can I pray for you? And right there by the side of the road, among all those strangers I never knew, I just began to pray for this man. A few moments later, um, fire truck came up, the paramedics came, there was a swarm of people, and I backed away, ran up the roadway, and jumped in the car with Colleen. We started to drive away, praying for Jim. And we started talking, and I said, that's amazing that we just happened to be right there, right then, at just the right time. If we would have left our house a few minutes later, we never would have been there. If we had taken a different route, we wouldn't have been there. And we began talking about how that was a God thing, how that was what we call a divine appointment, 
It was something that was ordered by God. It was something that was orchestrated by God. The theologians use the big word providence. It was the providence of God. That God has plans and God has purposes and he works all things after the counsel of his will. Every single thing in your life and my life because each day and every day, all throughout the day, there are circumstances and situations that he has ordered for you and only for you that we call divine appointments. In Psalm 37 and verse 23, the Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord and he delights in their path. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord and he delights in their path. Can you say that verse with me? The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord and he delights in their path. In other words, in the ordinary events of life, there are extraordinary opportunities that God will put before you and he'll put before me. Indeed, the whole book of Acts is one series of divine appointments after another. Peter and John, they go up to the gate beautiful in Acts chapter 3 and there's a lame man there. Divine appointment. Acts chapter 8, the Lord leads Philip out into the wilderness road and he just happens to meet an Ethiopian treasure. In Acts chapter 9, Ananias is told to go and meet this persecutor of the church, Saul, another divine appointment. In Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter sees a vision and goes to Caesarea and meets a man named Cornelius and the gospel starts going to the Gentiles. As you read the book of Acts, you discover Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, God's people just kept walking into one divine appointment after another. But if there's any chapter in the book of Acts that shows how we ought to be looking for divine appointments, it's in Acts chapter 16. Because in one chapter... We, th we see three amazing divine appointments. Paul and those who are with him, they have a divine appointment with a wealthy fashion designer. They have a divine appointment with a demon-possessed fortune teller. They have a divine appointment with a hardened, unbelieving prison Keeper. They have a divine appointment with someone who had a soft heart. They had a divine appointment with someone who had a bound heart. And they had a divine appointment with someone who had a hard heart. As we come into Acts chapter 16, the Apostle Paul and Silas are just beginning the second missionary journey of Paul. You'll see a map on the screen of the missionary journey of Paul as it begins in Paul's trip to Philippi. In his first missionary journey, the apostle Paul took a man named Barnabas and they went into the area of Galatia, Pisidia, and Antioch. They came back to the city of Jerusalem. There was what was called the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 where they had to decide, are the Gentiles going to keep the law or not? And so a decision was made. And then Paul and Barnabas, they go up to a place from Jerusalem, you see in the lower right, to a city called Antioch, but was the launching pad for all the missionary journeys of Paul in the book of Acts. And as they've been there for a little while, Paul tells Barnabas, let, let, let's go out and take another trip. And Barnabas wants to take... Um, a young man named John Mark who had deserted Paul and Barnabas on the first trip. And Paul says, no way, no how. And Barnabas says, yes, sir. And Paul says, no way. And the Bible says that they had a disagreement about it. And so um, Barnabas takes John Mark and goes to his home island called Cyprus. And Paul picks up a man named Silas and goes his own way. 
uh, through all these 30 years of teaching in Bible colleges, students always ask me, Pastor Larry, who was right and who was wrong? <laughs> was, was Paul right and Barnabas wrong? Was Barnabas right and Paul wrong? My answer is, doesn't make any difference. Before that, there was only one missionary team. After that, there were two. <laughs> is it possible God could even work through disagreements of people to accomplish his, his will and his purpose? Absolutely. God's math is always way different than ours. He has a way of working all things together for good, no matter what they are. And so Paul and Silas, he picks up Silas and heads out. And Acts chapter 15, notice how it ends in verse 40. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And they went throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Silas, you can study about him later, was a prophet and a key leader in the church in Jerusalem. Uh, Silas was among those that were sent out from Jerusalem in, in Acts chapter 15 to take the decrees of the apostles to all the Gentiles. Silas was also called Silvanus. He helped Paul write 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and he helped Peter write the book of 1st Peter. He was a very key and important person. And God was putting together a team to get at the right place at the right time for a divine appointment. And so Silas and Paul, they set out, and in Acts 16, they, then he, Paul, came to Derbe and to Lystra. You see these cities on the map. Behold, a certain disciple was there. His name was Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek. He was from a mixed family. His father was probably an unbeliever. His mother was a believer. There are many people who come from such families. Timothy was like that. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Uh, Paul didn't have to do that. Timothy didn't have to do that. Uh, the Jerusalem Council said they didn't have to do that. That's what, we're the, what they were going to go and tell all the Gentiles. But Paul didn't want to create a problem. He later would write, we, we become all things to all men. In other words, we, we give up our rights for the sake of reaching other people. And young Timothy was willing to submit to this because there was a higher calling on his life. The call of God. What might you need to give up so that you can fulfill the call of God on your life? What might the Lord, what right might the Lord be asking you to lay down for a greater cause, the sake of the gospel? So he takes Timothy and circumcises him. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in their numbers Daily, Timothy, in a sense, was a divine appointment. Paul's going along with Silas, and they come, and there's Timothy. And Timothy would be huge in Paul's life, huge. Timothy would become a son in the faith for Paul. Timothy would be Paul's favorite co-worker. Timothy would later become the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Timothy would be there. When Paul died, Paul would save him. I don't have anyone else like him. He's like my son. Paul was going through life. Paul was following the Lord. And all of a sudden, Timothy now is added to the team. So you have Silas with Paul, and now you have Timothy. Verse 6, now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. Pause there for a moment. This is amazing. You see on the map, as they're going along, they wanted to go down into Asia Minor, and the Holy Spirit said no. 
Then they wanted to go up into Bithynia and the Holy Spirit said no. Now I find this remarkable because Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And yet the Holy Spirit is saying, but I don't want you to do it over there. And I don't want you to do it in this other place. You ask, how did that, how did they know that? How did the Holy Spirit tell them that? We don't know. It might have been through circumstances. It might have been through a prophecy. It might have been as they were in prayer. They just felt what we call a check in their spirit. They just knew, no, this is not the right way to go. We're not supposed to go that way. And we're not supposed to go that way. And the Lord will often lead us in that way. In Romans 8 and verse 14, it says, As many as le are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. They are the sons of God. And each day and every day, God wants to lead you. If you listen, if you have the ears to hear that still, small voice. So they wanted to go down and the Holy Spirit said no. They wanted to go up and the Holy Spirit said no. They can't go back. There's only one direction. Forward. <laughs> Forward. And what was a disappointment to them was going to become the greatest blessing they could ever imagine. Some as well said that if you take the word disappointment and you change the first letter of that word from a D to an H, a disappointment becomes his appointment. Just change one letter, then you see that obstacles can turn into opportunities. That God has a better way and a better path. You think, well, why didn't I get that job? Or why didn't we get this house? Or why, didn't, why couldn't I go there? Or why couldn't I do this? Maybe God's in it. Because he has divine appointments waiting for you that will blow your mind, that are far beyond your imagination. This is what's happened to God's people in so many times throughout church history. There was a great missionary named William Carey. He so wanted to go to Polynesia. He ended up in India. This is another missionary, great missionary. David Livingstone, China, China, China. Oh, God, send me to China. He goes to Africa. Had an Iron Judson. He wanted to go to India, and God sent him to Burma. Why? Because God knows what's best. God knows what's best. And the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And he delights in their path. And God was putting something together here that was going to be absolutely incredible. So they go forward. After verse 7, after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, you see it here on the map. They ran out of land. They just came to the ocean. And they're waiting there in Troas. And verse 9 says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Macedonia, as we'll be learning, was the northern part of Greece. And the most important town there was a town called, a city called Philippi. And as you're going to learn in a minute, the people there dressed in a very particular way. So anyone knew who was a Macedonian. And Paul has a vision. There's a man of Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. You know, God can speak to people through visions. You read the book of Acts and Acts chapter 10, Peter had a vision. And God still does that kind of thing today. I, I remember when we were in Bible college, there was a missionary who was telling about how his father went to Panama City. His father was a wealthy banker in San Jose, but he felt the call of God on his life. And so he began to take classes in a Bible college at night to prepare himself to go on the mission field. And one night, God gave him a vision. He saw this man in Panama. He was out in the middle of a field with a plow and the field was half plowed. And in his vision, this man said to him, come to Panama and help me. Come to Panama and help me. I thought, well, this is amazing. <laughs> he figured if he's going to go to Panama, he did, 
he needed to know Spanish. And so he started taking Spanish classes. He eventually went down to Panama City, began to work there. God began to bless it, all kinds of churches and fruit. And I was blessing his ministry. One night he got a call on the phone. There was someone from a hospital that was nearby. And they said, there's this old man in a hospital room and uh, he doesn't have any family or friends and he needs somebody to come and visit him. Uh, he said, would you be willing to come over and just talk to him and pray with him? And so the missionary went over and the moment he walked in the door, it was the man he had seen in the vision. The man was a Methodist missionary. He was in Panama and didn't know what to do. He was crying out to God, saying, send us some help, Lord. We need some help. We need some help. Please send someone in the field. Paul has a vision. God supernaturally is ordering and directing his steps. Oh, look at it again. Verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and he pleaded with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after we had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. I've emphasized a couple of words, the word we and us. This is Calvary Chapuccino Valley. So you guys are careful students of the Bible. And those two words just jumped off that page because you know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. And now all of a sudden, Luke is including himself in this team. The team of three has now become a team of four. Luke the doctor, you study about his life, you discover that Luke was from a city called Philippi. It had a huge medical center in it, and he trained there to become a doctor. He became a doctor to a wealthy person in Antioch. Later, he moved to the city of Troas. In Antioch, he would have met up with Paul and Silas. Now he lives in Troas, and when Paul and Silas and Timothy come to Troas, all of a sudden, they connect with Luke. God's working something out. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, and he delights in their path. So he says in verse 10, now after he had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis. You see on the map, Troas goes over to Neapolis, halfway in between, it's about 150 miles from, ne from uh, Troas to Neapolis. Halfway in between is an island about the size of Catalina Island. And one day there, and one day the next. Got there in two days. Normally it took five days. The wind was behind them. When you're in the will of God, it's amazing how God blesses your life. The Lord was giving them favor. The Lord was sending them on their way. They had no idea that the first church in Europe was about to happen. They had no idea the unbelievable divine appointments that were waiting them. They were just trying to be obedient day by day to listen to the voice of God, to follow the Spirit of God, to do what the Lord told them to do, to do what God was showing them to do. Verse 11, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to, circle this, Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city some days. You will see on the screen an artist's rendition of what the city of Philippi looked like when these four men, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, walked into it. Philippi was one of the largest, most strategic cities in Europe with an interesting history. 
It was called Crinides, which means the fountains, because originally there were fountains there. The Greeks started a city there that was named Philippi because the father of Alexander the Great, his name was Philip. And Alexander the Great named that city in honor of his father. And it, over the years, fell into decline. But then there was a very famous Roman battle that was fought there. All of you probably heard of Julius Caesar. He was assassinated by two Roman senators, Brutus and Cassius. They fled to the area of Philippi. The Romans sent two generals, two other senators after them, Anthony and Octavius. They surrounded the city of Philippi. They defeated their armies. And Brutus and Cassius committed suicide so they wouldn't be taken. And a lot of the veterans in the Roman army, they settled down there. And they started to build up the city and build up the city and build up the city. And it really grew when a main highway was connected to it called the Ignatian Way. It linked the then known worlds. It was right next to a very important river called the Gangetus River. That's going to be very important in a moment. But you see right by the river was this city. There were gold mines nearby, so they had lots of money. And because they had all these Roman army officers that settled it, they decided they were going to make the city like a miniature Rome. It was a colony, Luke writes. Colony is a place in another place where someone has citizenship from another place. We know it here in America because these used to be called the colonies. English citizens lived over here in the colonies. And every single person who was in the city of Philippi, they had Roman citizenship. Rome was in the country of Italy. Philippi was in the country of Greece. But every single person in the city of Philippi had Roman citizenship. That's why Paul will later write to this church in Philippians 3 and verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. Because they understood that more than anyone. And they prided themselves on being Roman citizens so much so that even though they were in Greece, they spoke Latin like the Italians did. Even though they were in Greece, they ate Italian food, pasta, spaghetti, and all that stuff. Even though they were in Greece, they even dressed like the Romans did. So that when you went into that city, you looked around and thought, this is like a miniature Rome. And it was a city of around 20,000 people, which was huge in those day, days. It had, as I mentioned, a medical center, a large jail. And very important, it was mostly Gentile people. There were not even 10 Jewish men in this city. We'll understand that in a moment because there wasn't a synagogue there. It took 10 Jewish men called a minion in order to establish a synagogue. And there was no synagogue there. In fact, it's kind of interesting. You can read the book of Philippians later. Did you know there are no Old Testament quotations in the book of Philippians? Why? Because the Gentiles were not familiar with the Old Testament. So into this thoroughly Roman, into this thoroughly pagan, into this thoroughly Gentile city, walk four men, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. The right people in the right place at just the right time. And they have three divine appointments with a woman who had a soft heart, with a girl who had a bound heart and with a man who had a hard heart. Their first divine appointment was with a wealthy fashion designer. Her name was Lydia and she had a soft heart. Notice in verse 13, And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So very important are those words. Why? It was the Sabbath, and Jewish people would worship on the Sabbath, but there was no synagogue, 
So they went out to the riverside. Why did they do that? Because Jews all throughout the world, when they were scattered at the end of the Old Testament, if there wasn't a synagogue, they would try to find a riverside to meet and pray. Because in Psalm 137, verse 1, by the rivers of Babylon, we wept. And they would find a riverside. And Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, they knew if you're going to find any people that are inclined toward the things of God on a Sabbath, they're going to be by the riverside. So they go out by that Gangetus River, and the women are there. <laughs> Why? Not ten Jewish men. There's not even a Jewish synagogue there. And as they go out there, it's a Holy Spirit setup. <laughs> The Holy Spirit's got it all arranged. Verse 14, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. Every one of those phrases are important. Purple in ancient times was the color of royalty. Only very wealthy people wore purple. I mean, it could say something like, she lived on Rodeo Drive <laughs> and sold Gucci. <laughs> then you would understand who she was. In the Word and Life Study Bible, they describe Thyatira. It says, Thyatira was a thriving manufacturing and commercial center. Its trade in purple was renowned in the Roman world. Purple was the most expensive of dyes and was a mark of wealth and royalty. This purple dye came from a shellfish found only in the northeastern section of the Mediterranean coast. It took, listen, it took 8,000 shellfish to produce just one gram of purple dye. Yeah, I have a word for that. You just heard it. Wow, that's amazing. They say purple cloth was ranked in value with gold and was important not only for adorning emperors and temples, but for tribute and international trade. We don't know when or why Lydia relocated to Philippi, but it was a smart business move as the Philippians were known for trying to outdo Rome in their dress. Might have been a smart business move in her mind, but it was a God thing. Because God got her in that place for that time so she could meet those four people. Look again. Verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. In other words, she was a Gentile who knew about the God of the Hebrews, who knew about the God of the Bible. She didn't know about Jesus. She didn't know about salvation. But she had a soft heart toward the things of God. And as they began to preach about Jesus Christ and Him being the only way of salvation, Verse 14 ends, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Listen, if you got four guys coming over to your house, it's got to be a pretty big house. She was wealthy. She had a huge house. What a perfect place for a church to meet. What a perfect place. The church in Philippi was going to meet in her house. God got her in Philippi just for the right time. And Paul puts, God puts Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke there to share the gospel. She comes to faith. I tell you, the steps of the righteous are order of the Lord. And he delights in their path. But Paul and his companions are going to have another divine appointment. With another lady, she's totally different than Lydia. <laughs> Instead of being a wealthy fashion designer, she's a demon-possessed fortune teller. Lydia was wealthy. This girl was poor. 
Lydia was free. This girl was a slave. Lydia was inclined toward the things of God. This girl was so bound in darkness, it's indescribable how bound she was in darkness. Notice in verse 16, now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us and she brought her masters much fortune, uh, much uh, money by fortune telling. Now, it's interesting. It says we went to prayer. The Jews would pray three times a day because in Psalm 55 and verse 17, it says morning, noon, and night will I pray. They would pray at nine. They would pray at 12. They would pray at three. And Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, they kept going back and forth to the river to pray all throughout the day. And as they were making their way down those streets of Philippi to go and pray, there's this demon-possessed slave girl who's bringing much profit by, from her masters. And she followed them and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God. Now, interesting, it says here, she, she in verse 16, she was possessed with a spirit. The Greek literally reads, she was possessed by the python. She was possessed by the python. Pastor Chuck, in his commentary on the book of Acts, describes it. He says, in the Greek world, the word for divination is from the root python. In the center of Greece, there was a prophetic center called the Oracle of Delphi. According to Greek mythology, Apollo had killed a great snake called Python at that site. The snake spirit was said to have remained in that spot and would inhabit prophets or prophetesses there. People would come to the oracle to get guidance. Python, through these channelers, who would speak to them in a strange voice. These channelers were demon-possessed, which is how they were able to speak for things they couldn't otherwise have known. Such was the case with this girl at Philippi, whose masters charged people money to come and get guidance from her. Evidently, some wealthy men going through the oracle at Delphi they found this poor girl, and she was giving out these channeling words. And they bought her, and they brought her back to Philippi so they could make money on her. I can think of nothing more horrible than being bound by men and being bound by Satan. And as Paul and Silas are going back and forth to pray, to pray, to pray all throughout the day, here she is in this hideous voice saying, verse 17, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. But Paul, being greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her at that very hour. Now, this is interesting. The girl is saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. True? Yes. And they're proclaiming to you the way of salvation. True? Yes. But Paul is greatly annoyed. He's greatly disturbed. Why? Because Satan is the most deceptive when he tells the truth. When he puts forth all kinds of error, but then he includes truth. That's what happens with the cults. There are many things they say that are true, but it's not all true. James Montgomery Boyce, the great pastor in Philadelphia, once wrote, the greatest danger to the church is when satanic agents, false teachers, tell the truth. For that is when they are the most deceptive Irenaeus, in his ancient book called Against Heresy, said, Error is indeed never set forth in its naked deformity, lest being thus exposed, it should at once be detected, but it is craftily decked out in an attractive dress, so as it to appear to the outward, in its outward form, to make it appear to the inexperienced more than the truth itself. And she did this for many days. These are servants of the Most High God. They're telling you the way of salvation. These are servants of the Most High God. And they're telling you the way of salvation. 
And verse 18 says she did this for many days, but Paul, being greatly annoyed. That's a good translation, but not the best translation. It means troubled. It means grieved. But Paul was experienced inner pain over this. Why? Not only because Satan is using this girl to deceive people, but I believe he cared about her. He cared about this bound, demon-possessed girl who was being used by men, who was being used by Satan, and pained in his heart, grieved in his heart. He said, that's enough. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And immediately she was delivered. Immediately. The power of God is much greater than the power of Satan. Paul didn't say, give me your name. Let's pray for two or three, five hours. No, he said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And she was instantly, totally set free. Why? Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Doesn't make any difference. How bound the person is doesn't make any difference. How possessed the person is doesn't make any difference. How much darkness they're in. When God sets a person free, they're free indeed. Listen, I'm so glad Paul listened to the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad he was obedient to the Lord because now this demon-possessed slave girl is set free. And you don't think that brought attention in Philippi? Well, there's a divine appointment with a wealthy fashion designer. She had a soft heart. There's a divine appointment with a demon-possessed fortune teller. She had a bound heart. But this would lead to a third divine appointment. A divine appointment with an unbelieving, hardened prison keeper. He had a hard heart. Notice what happened. Verse 19, but when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them out into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said to them, these men, notice, being Jews, trouble our city. We're Romans. We're Gentiles. These guys, the problem is, is that they're Jews and they're troubling our great city. Verse 21, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans. They were in Greece, but here they call themselves Romans to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. And having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. Wow. Wow. We need to think about this for a moment. It says here in verse 22 that they were beaten with rods. You all know about the scourging of Jesus using a cat of nine tails, another form of corporal punishment in ancient times especially used by the Romans who was beating with rods. They would take a bundle of birch branches. Sometimes they would put a sharp object in the mid middle of them. They would rip the clothes off of people. They would tie their, their arms to a post of some kind. And then they would take that bundle of rods of sticks and whack, whack, whack. They would just beat the living daylights out of a person. And this frenzied mob, they take Paul and Silas, to the magistrates, they rip off their clothes. They start beating them with rods. Verse 23, and when they had laid 
many stripes on them. They threw them into the prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Many stripes. By the way, this happened to Paul five times in the course of his life. And the jailer puts them into the inner prison and fastens their feet in stocks. Now, you read that word and you're thinking of those old English stocks, you know, where a person would stick their head in there and their hands in there or something like that. Not like the stocks of the Romans. The stocks of the Romans were not to keep a person. They were to torture a person. They were in the shape of an X, and what they would do, they were graduated markers, and they would just start stretching out the person, their arms and legs, as far as they possibly could get. Until their backs are bleeding, their muscles are cramping. What if that was you? Oh, Lord, I was obedient. <laughs> he, he said not, you said not to go down into Asia Minor. I didn't do it. You, you said not to go up into Bithynia. I didn't do it. I, I just went over to Troas. I saw this vision, this man of Macedonia. Come and help us. And I did, Lord. <laughs> the Lydia got saved and her, her whole family got saved. And this demon-possessed slave girl, now she's set free. And what do I get for it? Ever been there? But God had a purpose. He was allowing this to happen because of an amazing divine appointment. An absolutely amazing divine appointment. And Paul and Silas, they had the right perspective. They were fully surrendered to God. And they had joy in their heart. And we're willing to suffer. And so the most amazing verse, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them at midnight at the darkest part of the night. What are Paul and Silas doing? They're not saying, oh, God, you can do this to me. You do this to me. It serves you, Lord. Oh, God, why are you doing this to me? Oh, they understood. Oh, dear ones, they understood. The steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Every step is ordered of the Lord. Sometimes we find ourselves in hospitals. Sometimes we find ourselves in courtrooms. Sometimes we find ourselves in difficult places in life. But God is allowing it. Because sometimes when you're in the courtroom, there's a divine appointment. Sometimes when you're in the hospital, there's a divine appointment. Sometimes when you're in a car accident, there's a divine appointment. And God may allow difficulty to come into your life and my life. Because he needs you to be at a certain place at a certain time. And Paul and Silas, they knew that. They knew that. What would you be willing to suffer that someone would be in heaven? An illness? An accident? A bankruptcy? A legal case? Would you be willing to suffer that? Would you be willing to go through something so that God could use you that somebody else might be in eternity forever? That somebody in their whole family could be saved? That a church could be started? That the gospel could go into a new region you could never imagine? Paul and Silas understood it. And at midnight, the darkest part of the night, they're praying in the tense in the original is continuously. They're praying over and over and over again. And they were singing over and over and over again. And here's the amazing thing. It says here, and verse 25, and the prisoners were listening to them. You know, people are watching you. You know they're listening to you all the time. Your life is a testimony. Your life is a witness. Paul and Silas were praying and singing, and something happened. Verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake in Greek, a mega seismos. <laughs> 
so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. Listen, they weren't, they weren't singing and praying to get set free. They were singing and praying because they were free. No captivity could take their freedom. They were free and they were worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden there's this great earthquake. Verse 27, and the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Just like Brutus and Cassius, when the Romans came to get him, they committed suicide. He is about ready to commit suicide. Why? Because what they would do to a keeper of the prison in this case is they would torture them and then they would kill them. And they knew that was going to be his end. So he takes out his sword. He's about ready to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice. The Greek reads, a megaphone. Don't stop! <laughs> he calls out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light. And he ran in and he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. So amazing. Backs laid open and bloody from those being beaten with rust, stretched out in those stocks in the innermost prison, singing and praying. And all of a sudden, the keeper of the prison of the biggest city in that part of Macedonia, a very, very important official, comes running in, falling down on his hands and knees, trembling. And he called for a light. Verse 28 says, Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourselves no harm for we are here. Then he called for a light. He ran in and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They were singing about Jesus. They were singing about salvation. They were singing about the Lord. He had been watching them. And now he says, what, 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 what do I need to do? And Paul says, give a lot of money to the church. No. <laughs> 25 Hail Marys. 36 Apostles' Creeds. No. <laughs> what must I do to be saved? And they said, just believe on Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. In other words, everyone in the household that would believe would be saved. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. There was no baptism of infants. They, always, they all believed. If you believe and everybody in your house believes, then you're going to be saved. And they were saved and gave the outward sign, evidencing that by water baptism. What an amazing divine appointment. You see, dear ones, the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And he delights in their path. And it's amazing what God can do if you just listen to the still small voice and you be obedient because God wants to use you. As I was praying about what to share with you tonight, the Lord just so put it on my heart. Go over to Chino Valley and remind them that divine appointments are waiting for them all over the place. If they'll just pray for them and just ask for them. And I felt so much in my heart. We're three, three weeks away from Easter. What a great time to invite someone to Good Friday. What a great time to invite them on Easter Sunday. And who are they? They live next door to you. They live across the street from you. Divine appointments are waiting for you. Tomorrow morning at Starbucks. <laughs> They're waiting for you at the gas station. They're waiting for you in the supermarket. They're waiting for you in the malls. They're waiting for you in the beach. They're, they're even waiting for you in the traffic. <laughs> There's people all around us. 
And here's the wonderful thing. The church in the book of Acts didn't grow like it did because all the superstars were doing the work. We live in a day of celebrity Christianity. That's not Bible. Here's Bible. All of you do the work of the ministry. If it's up to David Rosales <laughs> to go invite everybody he possibly can to be here on Easter, there's not going to be very many people. But if every single person at Chino Valley would just be looking for those divine appointments, would wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I just want to be used by you. Please, Lord, bring people in my path that I can talk to, that I can pray with, that I can invite. Say, Pastor Lord, you're telling me I have to give them the four spiritual laws and jam the gospel down their throat. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying be who God has called you to be and look for those places because you never know what will happen. In August 2005, a Category 5 hurricane hit the Gulf Coast and uh, did so much damage in the city of New Orleans. And as God's people always do in responding to tragedy and need, they run. So many Christians went down to the Gulf. And so many were there in New Orleans. And I remember a friend of mine telling me about something that happened to their group when they went down there that was so amazing. When they finally got down there, they divided up into teams. And they were going to go from house to house just trying to help people in whatever way they possibly could. And so his particular group was given a slip of paper, go to the house at this particular address. So they looked on a map, tried to figure out where they were going. They started going, making their way to the house. Well, because of the floods and the damage and everything, all the signs are knocked down and crazy. And so they went down the wrong street and they went to the wrong house. They knocked on the door and said, uh, you know, we're Christians and we've come here to help you in whatever way we can. We were sent over here. The group sent us over here and they said, well, we didn't ask for any help. I said, well, can we help you? Is there anything that we can do? And so they opened the door. They let them in. They began to just share God's love with them. And they found out this older couple that was there uh, because they had lost everything, they were in such discouragement and despair. The husband um, was about ready to take his gun, shoot his wife, and then take his own life. And because <laughs> they went down the wrong street <laughs> to the wrong house, those people came to Jesus and are alive today. I tell you, the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. And he delights in their path. Pray for and look for. <laughs>